This morning, we thank you for your amazing grace. A grace that has pursued us through our rebellion and sent your son to be the sacrifice for our sins. A grace that adopts us as sons and daughters of God and wipes clean every act of rebellion we've ever done. And so, Father, today we rejoice in our relationship with you. And we ask that you would speak into our lives, that you would teach us, that you would change us, that you would heal us, and you would bring us closer in relationship to you than we've ever been before. This is our request. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. I invite you to take your, uh, your Bibles, your Bible apps, your uh, whatever it is that, that you can look up Scripture on. I had to move the bubbles out of my way. And... Uh, and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's some in the pews around you. If you don't own a Bible, take one of those, please. Uh, we would love for you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, let it be part of your life. Uh, today we are uh, continuing our, our study called Family Feud. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, also 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And, and as we do this, I want you to know that I, I get ready to preach this knowing that I could potentially offend half the crowd because today we're talking about the role of women and uh, you know it's the family feud series church has been fighting about this for 2,000 years society's been fighting longer and and, uh, and so we're going to try to unpack and see what God says about the role of women so here's my request to the ladies please hear the whole message <laughs> um you know, uh, it, it really distresses me if I see you get up and walk out, you know. If you're carrying a baby, it's one thing, but if you just, like, throw the Bible down and get up and walk out, that, that breaks my heart. Now, I would really love for you to hear the whole message. I, I don't expect you or, or ask that you agree with everything that I say, uh, but uh, what I would love is, is uh, for you to email the, the questions, the comments, the rebuttals, uh, whatever you have to say to me so that we can engage in a dialogue. Uh, because the role of women is not one of the essential doctrines here at Calvary, but we want you to understand what God has to say in His Word about this. So, so today is going to be a little bit more uh, of a teaching type of, of message, uh, so hang with me and respond to that. So, because uh, we want to see what God has to say. First, we're going to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 3. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Now, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. And every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. Hold that thought just for, you know, for a little bit. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought to cover his head since he or ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God but the woman is the glory of man for man did not come from woman but woman from man neither was man created for woman but woman for man for this reason and because of the angels the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head in the lord however woman is not independent of man nor is man independent of woman for as woman came from the man so also man is born of woman but everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is to her glory? For long hair is given as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. 1 Corinthians 14. Flip over a couple of pages. Beginning in verse 33. Again, same apostle. Writing to the same church says, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. And some of you are going, All right, didn't know those were in there, didn't really like those. Uh, didn't, didn't, not comfortable with what they said. Uh, these and other passages, such as 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Peter 3, raise some questions that we need to struggle with as followers of Jesus Christ. Um, as followers of Jesus Christ. This applies to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of the world. 
who believe that he died on the cross to pay for their sins and was raised from the dead and have made a commitment to follow him. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to wrestle with the implications of what these passages say. And, and the first point of struggle is this. Do you accept or reject the authority of the Bible? You accept or reject the authority of Scripture. Uh, you see, this is the foundational decision. Am I going to trust God to teach me wisdom and lead me to blessings, or am I going to doubt what He says? Because I'm sure there's some of you sitting here who said, I didn't know those passages were in the Bible, and I don't like them. And there's some of you who said, well, I knew they were in there, but I wasn't really paying attention to them. And there's others of you who said, no, I've, I've already made peace with those, and, and, I, and I've interpreted them the way that fits for my life. So here at Calvary, our very first essential belief, the stuff we will fight about, is this. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. We believe that God gave us this Word so that we could understand who He is, how we can be in relationship with Him, and how best to live our lives which is why we teach from Scripture, which is why we encourage you to be in life groups, which is why we encourage you to take the Bibles and take them home and read them so that God can speak into your life. Uh, and, and the first temptation that we face, and, and a temptation that women right now across this uh, congregation are facing, is to reject the authority of Scripture because you don't like what it says. See, that's the temptation. Satan is whispering into our head, well, you don't have to do that. You don't have to believe that. You, you know, these people are crazy if they think that you're going to listen to this and, and follow what it says. What are they thinking? And, and that's what Satan speaks right now to the ladies. He's saying that about the passage we just read. But he's also saying it to everyone about stuff that they don't like in the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, you will come across passages you don't like. I know I do. See, I'm not real fond of it when Jesus says, hey... Love your uh, enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Uh, that's not my favorite passage of Scripture. I don't know about you. Because when somebody hurts me, I want to hurt them back. That's just natural, isn't it? Naturally sinful. Because God says otherwise. And so I have to decide, am I going to believe God? Am I going to trust God? Am I going to do what He says and apply Scripture to my life even if I don't like it? You see, the truth is this, if you want to experience God's blessings, then you need to embrace His Word and live it as best you can. So do you accept or reject the authority of the Bible? That's the first and most important decision that you need to make today. Now, some of you are protesting right now. Okay, we just read that passage, but um, there's no head coverings on all the women in this room. And, and if I'm not mistaken, then Julie just spoke in church and taught all of us uh, even though it's aimed at the kids, uh, she's always talking to all of us. So if you embrace the authority of Scripture, then the next question is, how do we understand these passages? Because these passages have been used and abused in ungodly ways throughout the years. I I'm just going to say that, especially in light of the, the fact that the Bible elevates the role and status of women. The church has not always elevated the, the role and status of women, but the Bible does. The story of Scripture does. For instance, think about this. Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of the world, right? But He doesn't happen without Mary. Kind of an important figure in the story, don't you say? And then when Jesus rose from the dead, who were, who were the first people that saw Him? Okay, Mary Magdalene and the rest of the women. Now, what's interesting is we, we know that story. We tell that story. We don't think anything about that. But in the Jewish law, a woman couldn't give testimony in court. God chose to reveal His risen Son to people who had no legal standing to testify that Jesus was risen from the dead. Isn't that cool? God goes, I don't care what the culture says. Uh, I'm revealing myself to the people of faith who were there. He didn't care. So, so he, he revealed himself to him. Uh, one of the first missionary couples, our first missionaries at all in the church were a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. They never heard of them. That's okay. Philip the deacon had four daughters who were prophetesses, which means they taught and proclaimed the word of God. And they, and they prophesied over uh, Paul the apostle as he was making his way back to Jerusalem. And then the same apostle Paul who wrote the passage we just read wrote Galatians 3.28, inspired by the same God that says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. How do we understand these passages? In light of the whole counsel of Scripture and understanding. 
First thing I want to tell you is, is we got to understand how to study the Bible. If you're going to read the Bible, then you're going to come across passages that you don't understand. And you need to understand the first question is, what did the author intend to say to the people he was writing to? In other words, the audience he's getting it, what are they understanding that we don't understand? What is the culture, what is the context of that passage? See, there's stuff that was happening in first century Corinth that we don't know about. It's not in the Bible, it's just part of who they were, and Paul got it, and they got it, but we don't get it. Not unless we ask the questions, what's the culture and the context? For instance, you know, all that stuff about long hair, short hair, guys and, and women? Culturally, what's long hair and short hair? Hey, have you ever thought about that? Hey, there's not a link. It doesn't say in the Bible, guys should have like a white wall. And girls should never cut their hair. It, it doesn't say that. It just says that long hair, short hair. But that's a cultural distinction of what is long and what is short. Every society interprets that differently in terms of long and short. So you think about this. So what did the writer communicate to his readers? Culture and context. Let me share with you two uh, bits of culture and context about first century Corinth and the culture of Rome that may shed some light on understanding these passages which is why every woman in here doesn't have a head covering on, and we let Julie speak, uh, and, and others too. It's hard to keep her quiet, actually. But uh, <clears throat> the f first of all, we need to understand the place of women in the first century world, the first century Roman world. And this has multiple aspects. First of all, Jewish women, because the church was heavily Jewish. Remember this? Uh, half the people in the, in the church at the time were, were Jewish. And the role of Jewish women in the first century world was this. They were about a half step above property. Uh, whenever they left the house, they were veiled from head to toe. You know, think the, the Muslim burqa. You know, that's how Jewish women first century dressed when they went out in public. May not have been quite as extreme over the face, but they were covered. Always. Secondly, Jewish women never spoke to men in public. Not even their own husband would they speak to in public. And when they went to uh, synagogue, Jewish women never said a word. They were not allowed to speak at all in synagogue. Okay, that's Jewish women. What about Greek women? Well, in the Greek culture, there are pretty much two classes of women. First of all, and I don't know how else to put it, they were the Marian kind. Okay, these were the, the women who were raised to be the wives of, of uh, men of distinction. And basically, when you got married as a Greek woman, you pretty much were cloistered. You were separated from the world. You hung out with your family and with your servants and your household, your extended family. That's it. So in other words, a Greek wife wouldn't have been in public places at all to ever say anything in public. That's reality. Now, the other class of women in the Greek culture were those who were loose and immoral. Uh, who served as the temple prostitutes, who, who, who basically were, uh, uh, you know, people just, I don't want to say ignored, but they were just that part of life. And Paul is writing to a church that is comprised of all of the above. All of the above. You've got Jewish women there, and you've got high-class Greek women there, and you've got the street women there, and, and, and they're all part of the church because Jesus has changed their lives. And then you've got to understand the city of Corinth itself. Because at the center of the city of Corinth is the temple of Aphrodite, who is the, you know, Greek goddess of love. <laughs> and every night from the, the temple of Aphrodite, a thousand temple prostitutes went out into the streets to encourage men to worship. And the indication that they were a temple prostitute, because you wouldn't want to approach the wrong lady and ask about worship, uh, would... Uh, the way that you could tell the, the temple prostitutes were that they shaved their hair. Now does it start to make sense? All the conversation about the hair and the covering and, and, and talking. And probably, the, the culture now all kind of comes together and you begin to understand what is Paul in essence trying to say to the Corinth Christian women? I think what he's trying to say is ladies don't dress and act like temple prostitutes. Don't cut your hair off so that people mistake you for uh, somebody who works at the temple of Aphrodite. Don't conduct yourself in a way that people think you are, you are uh, brash and, and one of those women. 
And, and here's the timeless truth that I think carries over from that passage that we read. Hey, ladies, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, don't dress and act like prostitutes. Is that something you can live with? Is that something you can deal with? Does that make sense out of this passage when you understand the culture and the context? I think that's the first thing that Paul is trying to say. And, and, and when I'm trying not to say too much there and get in trouble. So uh, <laughs> the filter is working right now. So the second thing that Paul is trying to say to the Corinth church is don't freak out your culture by embracing a freedom that alienates you. Uh, you know, because you're trying to reach the culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I don't want you to act in a way that when people come into the church, they are absolutely and totally blown away. They can't hear the message because of what you're doing. What am I talking about? I'm talking about women being unveiled and speaking in public. Remember, you've, you've got these people coming out of the Jewish culture where the women don't ever talk to the guys in public. And they don't ever say anything in, in gatherings. You've got these Greek women who don't ever go out at all. And then you've got the others who are like, well, when I talk to guys, it's usually about you know, something immoral. And, and imagine if you come into the church and the women are leading and teaching and doing these things. And people would just like be blown away like, hey, well, they got temple prostitutes leading their, their church. That, that's what the, the message would have been. And he said, look, you're trying to connect with your culture, so don't freak them out. Yes, you have freedom in Christ, but don't use that in a way that, that leads people away from the gospel. So here, let's make the cultural connection right now to today. We live in a culture, in a society, where we treat uh, gender equality as the norm. Okay? We don't make a whole lot of distinction between men and women. And, you know, with the way things are going in our culture, pretty soon the bathrooms are just going to be, you know, one. So uh, it's getting weirder and weirder all the time. But we live in a place of gender equality. And so if you came into the church trying to figure out who Jesus was and seeking him, and we made you ladies put hats on your head and told you to shut up, how are you going to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? <laughs> you're not because you're going to be out the door and heading away. Now, today, in our world, you go across the world halfway to the Middle East and Christian churches are conducting themselves with veiled women that are not speaking and participating in the service because that's the culture that they live in. That's the culture where they are. And they read this passage and it makes perfect sense to them because they're living in that culture that still doesn't recognize the full value of women. And in a lot of places, they're still a half a step above property. And that's a tragedy in our world. And yet they can take the gospel of Jesus Christ and apply it and understand it in their context and in their culture. And they can have the life-changing gospel presented right there. See, that's the brilliance of the gospel. God has given us a message of freedom and life change that penetrates all cultures and allows us to take the message of truth and forgiveness and life change and share it wherever we are in whatever context that we're in. See that in contrast to the monoculturalism of Islam, which has a one-size-fits-all, everybody's got to conform to this one culture. But we can worship and celebrate Christ in our language, in our music, in our culture, wherever that culture is. But it's going to look different based on the culture. So I hope that makes sense in how you read this and how you understand this. And it, and it opens the door to looking at the culture and context of Scripture. Now that we've placed these passages in context, let's talk about two approaches theologically. And, and, and again, this is a lot more teaching than, than maybe we normally do, but uh, sorry about that. I'm going to share with you two theological concepts or two theological approaches that are the, where the church in, a, in America today fights over the role of women in the church. How to understand that. Uh, and again, these are both biblical understandings of women in the church and how to understand that role, what Scripture teaches. They just don't agree on how to apply that. So I want you to know these two major uh, approaches because every one of you has a theological viewpoint. You just didn't know it. Kind of cool, I think. I'm going to give you words to, to describe it. So I respect both these viewpoints. I'll tell you which one's mine when I get done. So first of all, you have the complementarian understanding, which emphasizes God's created order. 
In other words, these are the people that, that hearken back to creation and say, well, in the beginning God created Adam, and then it was not good that man should be alone, and so out of Adam he created Eve, and, and they were a family. They complemented each other. They were partners in this endeavor, working together. And that's why the word complementarian is there, because they complement each other. And that it recognizes that they both have different roles created equally in God's image, but they have different roles that God wants them to play out. So this view recognizes uh, the husband is the head of the family, the, the pastor is a man, uh, and, and says that God created an intentional order and life works best when we live according to God's design. This is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 11 when he was kept referencing about the man was created and the woman was created for man and man represented God's, you know, you get all that stuff. That's what he's referencing is that whole uh, complementary order of creation. Now, the other theological viewpoint is called egalitarian. And yes, that's actually how the word's spelled. Egalitarian, and it emphasizes the equality of genders. Uh, it, really, the equality of believers of all kinds. And, and they're going to hearken to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 again, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And, and, and this view holds that in Christ, all the markers of gender, education, status, wealth, occupation, ethnicity are wiped out. And God can do what he wants with who he wants when he wants to do it. Period. And, and so they go for more the, the freedom and equality. Now those are the two competing theological viewpoints that are both rooted in Scripture, both biblical. And we respect both here at Calvary. We understand that wherever you came from may have informed uh, how you see this. Now, my personal viewpoint and the viewpoint of the, the pastoral leadership here at Calvary is that we are complementarian. We believe that God created this world and it works best in His order. And now, I say that understanding that throughout history, uh, that viewpoint and some of the passages have been abused. And I recognize that. Uh, I also recognize that... that uh, God makes exceptions to his order. And so uh, knowing he's God, he can do whatever he wants with whomever he wants whenever he wants it. So I wouldn't want to be in a church that had a, a woman as the lead pastor, but I'm not offended by the fact that there are churches with women pastors. That, that's just my viewpoint. In fact, if you're taking the, the aisle as a dividing line in the Christian world between complementarian over here and egalitarian over here, uh, this is where I live. Kind of about this side of the line. Because I have a lot more in common with those just across the line than I do with some of the crazy you know, relatives way over here that think that uh, you know, women can't do anything and their gifts need to be suppressed. But I also don't have a lot in common with the crazy you know, relatives over here that you know, have Mr. and Mrs. Pastor. You know, I just look at my own relationship with my wife and go, that would not work for us. <laughs> I don't think it would work for Calvary either. So... So what does that mean for us as a church? Well, at Calvary, it simply means that the lead pastor is going to be a man. Okay? It, it means that if I drop dead tomorrow, they're not going to be saying, okay, we're going to find the best man or woman for the job. It just means they're going to say, we're going to find the right man for the job. That, that's our conviction. It, it also means that uh, uh, when you come in and sit down and talk to us and you've got marital issues, we, you know, we're going to challenge the men first to lead the family. But we value and empower women to lead, to teach, to serve, to influence for the kingdom. Uh, you already mentioned Julie teaches in every one of our you know, services. And, and it has part of that. We don't have a, an issue with that. We have executive council, uh, which is made up of men and women, leaders in the church. And we don't freak out if, if a woman's actually teaching and, and uh, there's men present. Because a lot of you know, complementarian churches, that's a big no-no. You know, women can only teach women and small children. And, and uh, the men have to teach everybody else. And, and, and quite honestly, we don't freak out over that. Because we kind of figure, if you're smarter than me, you can teach me. If you know something that I don't know, you can teach me. You can challenge me to think and live differently. And, and we trust the Holy Spirit to apply that. So, so that's kind of where we are in terms of the approaches theologically. And again, I hope that, that makes some sense to you. Now let's make a few applications. A couple of applications. And these are going to be kind of brief. First of all, we are equal creations with different accountabilities. And, and you probably recognize the complementarian bias in that, because I say different accountabilities. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, we're all created in God's image, 
we're all equally valued, loved, redeemed, and called to serve by God. We just answer for different accountabilities. It's kind of like recognizing that boys and girls are different from early on, right? You got, you got both varieties in your family, and you know what I'm talking about, right? The little boys and the little girls are just wired differently. Right? We're, we're just different folk. We think differently, process differently, that kind of stuff. And out of that, we recognize that God has given us different accountabilities. So, for instance, if the husband is the head of the family, he has to answer to God for how he leads his family. Which is why if you come in and counsel with me as a, as a couple, I'm going to challenge the man to go first. I'm going to challenge the husband to lead his family. Now understand, that doesn't mean that he's the smartest one in his family. Doesn't mean he's the wisest one in his family. Doesn't mean he always knows best. I'm just saying, hey, look, God holds you accountable, first and foremost, for the health of your family. You need to lead. You need to take the responsibility because guess what? When, when it's judgment time, you have to stand up first and answer for your family. That, that's part of this understanding of different accountabilities. Personally, it means I think it's the men who should go to, to war and be on the front lines of military and fighting and dying in battle. I'm not comfortable with the whole idea of, hey, let's send, the, send everybody. Uh, and, and my wife is convinced that it is a theological concept that the men are the ones who are supposed to kill the bugs. <laughs> Don't know how it plays out in your family, but that's pretty much how it works in ours. And, and there's no debate or discussion on that one either. Uh, so equal creations, different accountabilities. Finally, everyone is created and gifted to make a difference in this world. Everyone. God made all of us in his image. God sent Jesus into this world to suffer and die for all of our sins, to redeem us from our brokenness and our lostness and to include us in his kingdom. And God has gifted and equipped every one of us to serve him and to make a difference in this world. So no matter who you are, whether you are young or old, male or female, married or single, it uh, doesn't matter your education, your job, your occupation, your social status, I pray that you are making a difference for the kingdom of God because God loves you and he purchased you with the blood of Jesus Christ so that you could make a difference for him, wherever you are and whomever you touch. Will you pray with me? Father, today, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for creating us as wonderfully different as we are and for blessing us with life that nothing in this world can take away. And Lord, today we've asked that you would teach us uh, not just big picture stuff about the roles of men and women, but we pray that you would teach us how we as your servants, as your children, can honor you, can bless you, and can serve you. And so this morning we pray that you would continue to, to speak into our lives even as we worship you and celebrate your goodness and your grace. Thank you most of all for saving us from our sins. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.